Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I want to return to an idea we've previously discussed on the podcast, and that is the simulation hypothesis. In particular, I want to discuss whether or not we can hack the simulation. There are a variety of arguments that can be made to verify or confirm that we are in a simulation. To give some background, Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom coined the term the simulation argument in a landmark paper in 2003. The idea of living in a simulated reality has been around for a long time in science, religion, and fiction. Bostrom's simulation argument is a philosophical proposition that suggests it is possible that our reality is a computer simulation created by an advanced civilization. Here is a summary of his argument. First of all, if technological civilization continued to advance at an exponential rate, it is likely that they will eventually be able to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality. Secondly, if it is possible to create such simulations, then it is likely that many such simulations will be created. These simulations would be created for various reasons, such as entertainment or research. And third, if we accept the first two premises, then it is likely that we are living in a computer simulation created by a more advanced civilization. Bostrom's argument suggests that if we assume that it is possible for a civilization to create simulations indistinguishable from reality, that they would want to create many such simulations, then the odds are that we are currently living in one of those simulations. In other words, our reality may be a simulation created by an advanced civilization. Bostrom does propose that it will be possible to simulate the actions of all the neurons in the brain and simulate the sensory input to that brain with enough accuracy to convince the simulation that it is a real person. For it to happen at such a scale as our universe, it would seem impossible. But Bostrom made some calculations that show that a super advanced civilization could do this on such a scale that these virtual minds tremendously outnumber real minds. There are a ton of articles and videos and interviews on the topic, and even people like Neil deGrasse Tyson have backed up this belief, even though he's not necessarily a credible source. An advanced civilization might want to run such simulations for science so it can understand its own history, to study the behavior of the types of minds that lived in the past. How could this all be possible? According to experts on the matter, this civilization would need a computer the size of of a large planet. Bostrom's biggest argument for this belief is called the simulation argument, which he states that if ancestor simulations are something an advanced civilization would end up creating, then most of the self-aware minds that ever come into existence are simulated ones. Another argument for this belief is the idea of the Boltzmann brain, which argues that in an infinite multiverse, it should be tremendously more common for particles to randomly assemble into a brain that is having the exact same experience as you are having right now, than for particles to create big bangs. Ancestor simulations is the idea that a very advanced civilization with incredibly advanced technologies and capabilities would want to go back and simulate different times in history. That to me is a very believable thing. There's other ideas that we can look at to confirm the idea that we are in a simulation. Particularly, it's a pixelated universe. A computer screen is pixelated. You can zoom into an image, but when you reach the scale of a pixel, zooming in makes no more sense. And our universe is pixelated in that you can keep zooming into the fabric of space, but once you reach Planck's length, then zooming in makes no sense. There's absolute zero. There are claims that at absolute zero, all motion ceases. And why should this be? You could argue that's analogous to a computer program freezing. There are universal constraints. There are at least 26 physical constraints that define the parameters of our universe. Speed of light, proton mass, Bohr's radius, etc. Who put them there and why? These would be analogous to the parameters of a computer game coded by a programmer. 
One really obvious sign that we are in a simulation is the observer effect. In reality, the probability that an individual electron could exist anywhere in the universe at any given time is a non-zero. It is only when we have an observer that its wave function collapses and we can identify an electron or any other subatomic particle in a particular place. In a computer simulation, all the simulated reality is not rendered all the time. So to limit the massive amount of memory that would be required, what is rendered is only what the player or observer sees. Computer characters are in a binary code. DNA-based life is not necessarily binary, but is closed. It's quaternary. Also, we can just look at probabilities. Given enough time and advances in computer technology and artificial intelligence, we will eventually be able to create a simulated universe like ours. Maybe this has already happened, and in this case, advanced entities could be running trillions of simulations. Theoretical physicist John Wheeler averred that the most fundamental aspect of the universe, and indeed reality, is not matter or energy, it is information. If that's the case, then there is nothing to stop us from assuming that the universe is a simulation. But there are hard limits on the simulation. The speed of light means that we can't go beyond this solar system. If we could go beyond the solar system, it would just simply take up too much information and would be too hard to render the simulation. Reality is computational. Neurobiologist Andrew Gallimore points out that all events that happen at the quantum level, the collision of particles, the decay of particles, or the joining of particles are nothing more than the processing of information according to rules or computations. John Wheeler says every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself derives its function, its meaning, its very existence entirely from the apparatus elicited answers to yes or no or binary choices or bits. Gallimore explains, it is the processing of these bits according to a rule set that generates the observed physics of our universe at its deepest level. Deeper than the atom and more fundamental than the quark, the universe is running a low-level computation. Conrad Zuse, inventor of the world's first programmable computer, posits that at any given moment, the universe exists in a specific state which updates with each click of time. In other words, the universe is computable and it is in fact computing itself. Boston University professor of electrical and computer engineering Tommaso Toffoli has this to say, in a sense, nature has been continually computing the next state of the universe for billions of years. All we have to do, and actually all we can do, is hitch a ride on this huge ongoing computation. The simulation hypothesis sounds suspiciously like the computer geek's version of the creationist story. Simply substitute God with the programmer. And that's certainly possible. Every epoch has its own limited metaphors to make sense of reality. This is the metaphor we're using now because this is the relationship that we have with our technologies. And so it's a way for us to understand reality. We had the ceramic model of the universe, the creator as a sort of cosmic potter. And then we had the steam industrial model, the creator pulling levers and shifting gears. And today, our dominant metaphors are computing-based source codes and simulations. This is what we do as humans. We try to make sense of reality with the limited senses that we have. To think we can have an absolute understanding of such a grand and possibly infinite universe is probably an example of our own hubris. Star Trek Next Generation has two excellent episodes, Elementary Dear Data and Ship in a Bottle, in which Data plays Sherlock Holmes in the holodeck. In his nemesis, the virtual Dr. Moriarty becomes self-aware. They're both exquisite episodes and superb examples of science fiction at their best. Who knows what the future holds? Ray Kurzweil, director of engineering at Google and one of the best predictors of future technologies, says that in the next 100 years, we will see the equivalent of 20,000 years worth of progress. Ultimately, super AI will supersede human intelligence. It's simply a matter of time. It could be 45 years or 45 centuries, but we will be able to create simulations at some point. So you may not believe that we are in a simulation, but let's for just sake of argument, assume that we are in a simulation with the evidence that we have. 
The question I'm asking for this episode is can we hack the simulation? Obviously, the idea that we may be living in a simulation is a topic of philosophical and scientific speculation. We have no definitive way to prove it. However, if you wanted to experiment with your environment to try and gather evidence that you are in a simulation, here are some ideas that we can try and test out. First of all, we observe and analyze the patterns. If you are inside a simulation, there must be some underlying patterns that govern its behavior. So we should start by observing and analyzing these patterns. Look at any inconsistencies or unusual behavior that could potentially be exploited. This would allow us to hack the simulation. Secondly, we would look for glitches. Similar to real-life software programs, simulations can also have glitches or bugs. Look for any instances where the simulation seems to break or behave in unexpected ways. These glitches could potentially be exploited to gain access to areas or abilities that are not normally available. I experience glitches sometimes in objects disappearing, and on a group level we experience glitches with the Mandela effect. We've all experienced the Mandela effect on some level, be it the Bernstein Bears or Jif or Jiffy Peanut Butter. There's a whole history of it. Now, if you haven't heard of the Mandela effect, there is this hypothesis that many people believe that Mandela died and they remember watching his funeral. Nelson Mandela didn't die. And so later on, people were surprised that he was still alive. And there's this unusual experience that people had. And they called it the Mandela effect. I've experienced this with a number of deaths where somebody dies and I remember them dying. For instance, Darth Vader saying, Luke, I am your father. He didn't say that. In actuality, Darth Vader says, no, I am your father. Perhaps it's just collective amnesia or a glitch in our memory, but I clearly remember that. Another is in the movie Snow White. When the evil witch says, mirror, mirror on the wall. Now, I clearly remember the evil witch saying that, mirror, mirror on the wall. That is ingrained in my memory, and I am absolutely for sure that the evil witch said that in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But in reality, the evil witch says magic mirror on the wall. Now, these may be a result of just simple collective memory malfunction or the process of human memory being somewhat fallible. But I believe that they are proof that the simulation can be changed and is altered and we can hack the simulation. That there are changes that occur when we change the reality. If it's a subtle change in which there are somewhat questions about the simulation, then we can change that reality. I do believe that glitches in the reality show us that we can make minor modifications in the reality. The third thing we can do is experiment with the environment. Try interacting with this environment and assuming that it's simulated in different ways to see if we can uncover any secrets or hidden abilities. For example, we could try jumping higher than we normally would or see if we can phase through solid objects. Continue experimenting with these aspects of our reality. And I think we continue to do this, we will find that we are in a simulation. The fourth thing I think we can do to hack the simulation is to collaborate with others. If we're not alone in the simulation, we should try collaborating with others who have similar goals, work together to analyze the patterns, uncover glitches, and experiment with the environment. Two heads are always better than one. The fifth thing to hack this reality that we're in is focus on our thoughts. In a simulation, our thoughts and perceptions may be influenced or even controlled by the simulation itself. So focusing on our thoughts, trying to become aware of any patterns or influences that may be present within our thought patterns. If we can identify these patterns, we may be able to break free from the simulation's control. The sixth thing that I think we can do is attempt to communicate with the outside world. If we are living in a simulation, there may be a way to communicate with the programmers or the operators of the simulation. We can try to send messages or create a code that is not explainable by natural phenomena. I think we can do this through prayer 
and other means, and I am open to suggestions for this idea. But I do believe that we may be able to verify that we're in a simulation by this method of trying to communicate with the outside world. There may be some ways for us to try to communicate with the outside world. We can look for hidden messages. If we're in a simulation, there may be hidden messages or codes that have been left behind by the simulation's creators. Looking for patterns and repeating numbers or anything that seems out of place, that could be clues to a hidden message. So if there's glitches or things that seem out of place, it could be a message that we're getting. Oftentimes we receive messages from our intuition. Synchronicities, those could be messages that we're getting from the outside world. We can use advanced technology. If we have access to advanced technologies within the simulation, such as powerful computers or advanced communication devices, we could try to use them to communicate with the outside world. We could try to send a signal or message through the internet or use an advanced communication device to send a message to a satellite. Who knows? We need to think outside of the box. We can also try to send a message through the simulation. If we cannot directly communicate with the outside world, we could try to send a message through the simulation itself. This could involve creating a message or pattern that is unlikely to occur naturally, hoping that it catches the attention of the simulation's creators. I believe that meditation and lucid dreaming is an area in which we can communicate with the outside world outside of the simulation. Some people believe it may be possible to communicate with other dimensions or realities through meditation or lucid dreaming. Obviously, there's no scientific evidence to support this, but there wouldn't be if we were in a simulation. We could also test the limits of the simulation. If we're living in a simulation, there may be limits to what we can do or achieve. We could try to push the boundaries of our environment to see if there are any constraints or limitations that cannot be explained by natural phenomenon. One way we can do this is to create complex simulations within this simulation or run intensive co computational tasks to see if there are any signs of the simulation struggling to keep up. We can look for inconsistencies or paradoxes. If we're in a simulation, there may be inconsistencies or paradoxes in the way the world operates. For example, we could try to observe whether the laws of physics are always consistent or if they sometimes behave in unexpected ways. Those are some things that we can do. In an article in Scientific American, Caleb Scharf tries to ask the question, can we force the universe to crash? And if we're all living in a simulation, it would be good, albeit risky, to find out for sure. He says, intriguingly, the simulation hypothesis might be testable under certain assumptions. We might suppose that a simulation has its limitations. The most obvious one, extrapolating from the current state of digital computation is simply that a simulation will have to make approximations to save on information storage and calculation overheads. It could have limits on accuracy and precision. One way that those limits could manifest themselves is in the discretization of the world, perhaps showing up in spatial and temporal resolution barriers. Although we do not think there are some absolute limits in what constitutes meaningful small distance or time intervals, the Planck scale and Planck time, that has to do with the limits of our current understanding of physics rather than the kind of resolution limits on your pixelated screens. Nonetheless, recent research suggests that the true limit of meaningful intervals of time might be orders of magnitude larger than, than the traditional Planck time. But the nearest test of the hypothesis would be to crash the system that runs the simulation Perhaps that's ill-advised, but if we are all virtual entities anyway, does it matter? Presumably a quick reboot and restore might bring us back online and we might not even remember what happened. So how do we bring down a simulation from within it? The most obvious strategy would be to cause the equivalent of a stack overflow, asking for more space in the active memory of a program than is available by creating an infinitely or at least excessively recursive process. And the way to do that would be to build our own simulated realities designed so that within those virtual worlds are entities creating their version of a simulated reality, which is in turn doing the same and so on all the way down the rabbit hole. If all this worked, the universe as we know it might crash, revealing itself as a mirage as we winked out of existence. You could argue that any species capable of simulating a reality, like our own, would surely anticipate this eventuality and build in some safeguards 
to prevent it from happening. For instance, we might discover that it is strangely and inexplicably impossible to actually make simulated universes of our own. No matter how powerful our computer systems are, whether generalized quantum computers or otherwise, that in itself could be a sign that we already exist inside a simulation. Of course, the original programmers might have even anticipated that scenario too and found some way to trick us, perhaps just streaming us information from other simulation runs rather than letting us run our own. But interventions like this risk undermining the reason that we're running the simulation, which brings us to another amazing argument. Preston Green argues in an article written by Brandon Mitchell and A.J. Latham in Erkin called Ancestor Simulations and the Danger of Simulation probes he says that we should not conduct simulation investigations because the risk that we might be terminated if our world is a simulation designed to research various counterfactuals about the world of the simulators. He argues that we shouldn't run experiments designed to test whether we are in an ancestor simulation because such experiments would result in our being terminated. A principal motivation for running a simulation is to investigate what's actually happening or counterfactuals about the history but if inhabitants of the simulation discover they are in a simulation, the entire simulation becomes moot and they would shut it down. So while a successful simulation probe and experiment designed to determine whether the world is a simulation might contribute to our knowledge of reality, it could also result in our termination. It's food for thought. Who knows? That is certainly something to consider. Why do we need to know if we're in a simulation? seems very realistic is it important for us to know my point is if we discover on a subtle level that we're in a simulation we can hack the simulation and it allows us to exist within the simulation in a specific way there's also the other argument that we are intended to learn that we're in a simulation and then once we discover we're in a simulation our program gets rebooted into another level of the program and that is part of our journey is to awaken within the simulation all of these things are possible. Why are we asking these questions? Ultimately, the only way that we'll really ever know is through personal experience. Our own reporting and discussion of effects that we might have, such as Philip K. Dick. If you check out my episode where Philip K. Dick explains his own experiences, where he says that he felt like the simulation was rerun and variables were changed, while he was in the simulation, he became aware of this. There are a number of people that have explained situations in their own life that seem to confirm this. So the question is, is this important? Do we need to know it? Well, if we are existing within a simulation, we may want to understand the intention of the simulation. It may help define our own journeys in this life that we're in. And we may be able to hack the simulation knowing and understanding that our thoughts play a part in the programming process and we can utilize our thoughts as a means of interacting with the simulation. We may be able to submit requests to the simulation through prayers and intentions and affirmations and visualizations because seemingly our own visualizations would coexist within the simulation. These things would then confirm what I've been saying all along that our thoughts create reality. This may give you at least some understanding of the process of reality creation. Taking this perspective into mind, when we go into meditation and utilize different reality creation techniques, understanding the computational nature of the reality that we're in, it may help us to manifest the things that we want. If you understand that you're interacting with coded laws that allow for the emergence of futuristic variables within the game simulation. That is all it is. The question then comes, are we in a game where we're playing and there is no end to it? Or are we in a movie where we're playing parts and there is no changing interaction within the game? We're just simply playing a role in the game and everything that happens is programmed where we don't have any necessary freedom to interact within the, the simulation. My own theory is that it, it's a game. Neville Goddard might say that it's a drama and that we're simply playing a role like an actor. It is our own 
place to figure this out. But I believe that upon death, we move outside of the simulation, perhaps into another level of the simulation. And we are in a nested simulation within a group of simulations. And the outside of the simulation may happen way, way beyond this. Who knows? That's my own feelings. But I'd love to get your thoughts on this particular idea. It fascinates me and I could talk about it forever. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out my art at www.newearth.art and welcome to The Reality Revolution.